We have a company called Ubit, O-O-B-I-T, and we're making payment in crypto really simple. But the business is founded out of Israel. They make great technology there. I come in as a strategic investor and become president of the company. You download the wallet and you'll be able to upload some crypto either via credit card or transferring it to the wallet. And then you walk across to any shop that's got Visa MasterCard and you spend it. Top 50 currencies you'll be able to use anywhere around the world, whether it's Ripple, whether it's USDT, Bitcoin, anything, you just spend immediately. You have just heard from Philip Lord, President of Ubit. Philip has more than 25 years experience in global capital markets where he has invested and structured deals in the US, Europe, Asia, and Australia. He also has gained extensive knowledge of crypto markets, including coin and token issuance and decentralized exchanges and platforms. So let us dive right in. There we go, live at WebEx Asia with Philip Lord. Welcome to Tokyo. Extremely good to be here. I lived here for three years. It's always great coming back to Japan, not just for the food, but see the development in technology and the whole city booming. So three years was when? when? Too many years ago, unfortunately. <laughs> it was in 2000 to 2003 when I was working for Nomura. Fantastic experience, but I invested in Japan for 10 years plus that afterwards, remotely from Hong Kong, like a lot of bankers did. 20 years, we must notice many changes. What was the most impressive when you got off the plane? Obviously, the buildings around Otomachi have drastically changed and it's a different city, but there's always constantly new technologies popping up here. And I think Japanese are just one of the lead innovators in the world. There's many things that I notice. It's always good to have the toilet seats as well. <laughs> To be stereotyped, the taxi is unbelievable here. I think New York taxi should take a leap out of Japan's book for that. You're obviously here for business. Yeah. So what's the latest venture? We have a company called Ubit, O-O-B-I-T, and we're basically just making payment in crypto really simple. What we want to do is make it mainstream for everybody, bring hundreds and hundreds of millions of users in. The business is founded out of Israel. They make great technology there. To be honest, I come in as a strategic investor and become president of the company. The short of it is you download the wallet and you'll be able to upload some crypto either via credit card or transferring it to the wallet. And then you walk across to any shop that's got Visa MasterCard and you spend it. Top 50 currencies you'll be able to use anywhere around the world, whether it's Ripple, whether it's USDT, Bitcoin, anything. You can just spend immediately. There's a transaction fee on it to the consumer. It's not charged at the shop level or the, the point of sale level, but it's a very reasonable fee. It competes drastically cheaper than OTC. We want to make everybody use the crypto that they have for spending. So you made a double bet, you're spending your time on the venture and you also invested. Yeah. There are a few players in this space. As an old investment hand, you certainly have done your due diligence. Why this company versus anybody else? What's the differentiator? I couldn't see how this was so obvious and not been done. One of the reasons is there's nine or ten bits in the back end, whether it's regulation, whether it's tech integration. And yes, there is some competition, like in the traditional cards, Binance has a card, Crypto.com has cards. But the process, it's where your passport is issued, that you can get that. Coinbase has a card so US passport holders can get it. But then you're still predominantly spending it in USDT, right? What we wanted to do was make it more about the top 50 currencies. If I've made money on Ripple, maybe I feel like buying some new shoes or a new top or something, but I want to be able to spend it immediately. I don't want to have to transfer it to USDT and then transfer it to OTC and get my cash out. This is seconds, not 24 hours to get your cash in your bank account. So it's instantaneous. There is some competition, but it's in the card format and the competition is like iPhone 1 and we're like iPhone 15. For the shop, for the merchant, they will receive fiat at the end. They have no idea. It's Anything that goes, goes through the Visa or MasterCard rails is also just fiat. They, they exactly. Yeah. So there's so we, some bouncing back of messages before that converts it into regular format. Exactly. We're just a conversion engine. We're planning to launch with a B2C model, which will roll out in Europe initially and in uh, other countries shortly afterwards. Longer term, we want to integrate this into MetaMask and trust the big wallets. We want to be a B2B solution so everybody can spend it. That's the reason why we feel confident. There's you know, not you know, 1 million, 2 million users. There's hundreds of millions of users. With the US, obviously, there's a lot of noise. They're regulating. There's unclear regulation. The US is 5% of the world population, right? That's a big lot of noise inhibiting innovation. If you go to Africa, if you go to emerging markets, USDT is a very used currency and it will be continue to be used. We want to make sure that is a lot more mainstream and I think simplify this process for everybody. And it seems these ecosystems are converging. Circle got a MPI license in Singapore. Clearly, there's something that's moving these two together. You're basically playing on that wave going forward. 
Theirs is more of an institutional grade offering, but it's more than a retail offering. We want a retail game. We want people spending five bucks to 500 bucks. The launch will be in Europe. Yeah, correct. For a European passport holder, they download the app, they load it up, and then they can spend it globally at any point of sale in Master Visa Card. It's anchored really on the passport. Me, right. as a European citizen, even living outside, having exactly. a resident outside, I could use it. Exactly. Really? Yeah. It's so, just one, we, one customer. The regulation is done at the passport level. Wherever we go next will be approved by the country level. Um, We're super keen to look at Japan, but got to figure it out. I don't want to break any laws. We're not like crazy Bitcoin maximalists. We like to visit countries. We want to do things the proper way. I really need to look back because in 2017-18, before the cryptocurrency exchange regulation came into effect here, you had cards from some of the huge electronics retailers that were doing similar stuff. You could come with crypto and clearly target it for Chinese tourists that bring yeah. their money out of the country this way. I'm not sure that's still there after the regulation came in, so we need to ask a lawyer who's no, no stuff. I think there's always short-term solutions, right? And generally they're for like some sort of offshore tax avoidance reason. And But that's not our game. Our game is mainstream. We want to bring it to hundreds of millions of users and do things the right way. And to get it to the 100 million users, you need some distribution capability to get people onto the card and use them instead of whatever Miles cards they might have in their wallet right now. Yeah, it's a great question. How are we going to acquire them? Obviously, we have a B2C strategy of uh, user acquisition. But partnering with a lot of the existing wallets, that's our longer term game because I don't know how many exactly MetaMask has on, but let's say it's 30 million. OKX has 50 million users. Bybit has 90 million users. They all have exchange wallets, a B2B solution for these type of people. Also the gaming companies, I'm about two investments in the sector, payments and gaming. There's a lot of development in cloud gaming and that's going to bring a lot more AAA gamers into the world. Web 2 is going to Web 3, so there's going to be NFTs. They're going to get currency. How do they spend it? I want to be that gap. So I think there's a combination of partnering B2B, but also partnering with gaming companies where they're going to bring a lot of new. There's a lot, so much change going on in that space. It seems a bit late maybe compared to the global competition, but Japan is currently going nuts about NFTs. Asta launched one together with Seven Bank. They could donate to environmental causes and you got one of for NFTs created by popular artists. That's certainly something that would fly here. I was just looking at uh, SBI downstairs today. SBI NFT, I'm like, you guys are fintech investors. What are you guys doing in the NFT space? But they've launched an open sea slash Japanese Web2 companies going mm. overseas NFT marketplace. And I was very impressed by them. They've got a great big stand down here. So I think Japan has this way of creating the unexpected and taking it mainstream. Part of that was maybe expected because NFTs is the only white space from a regulatory perspective. When the cryptocurrency trading volumes declined, all the regulated exchanges started in an NFT marketplace. You've got lots of digital artists that are publishing this way as a new source of revenue, plus all the gaming companies. I yeah, think. we're in the Middle East. We're based there. Was it? Saudi's just bought, spent $38 billion on gaming companies last year. They bought 7% from Nintendo and topped up again, I think, back in, in May. There's there's a lot of big bucks going into this gaming space. Everybody talks as you know, 3 billion users, using mobile, but the AAA games, the World of Warcrafts, the Fifas, the you know, Fortnite, there's only really a couple of hundred million users in that with the development of what NVIDIA is doing or the cloud. I know there's new cloud gaming companies coming to market that will make it a lot better experience and remove the latency for users to play those games. If you're a kid in Zambia on a seven-year-old laptop, you're at a massive disadvantage against the kid in Tokyo, right, who's playing on a Nintendo piece of hardware. That's not an even competition. When cloud gaming takes over, and it is going to, it's going to bring those AAA games to the masses. And that kid will be as equal as the guy in Tokyo or London with the best internet and the best hardware. And that's going to be a massive user acquisition strategy for companies, I think, sponsoring these tournaments. When I had last conversation with a company based in Dubai, that was about sharing credit cards because they wanted to avoid people sending money across. So they give you a secure way to share your card as a migrant worker in the Middle yeah. East with your family home in Pakistan or so. And then they can go to e-commerce shops and spend it. That's maybe also an option, especially given the migrant population that you have in the region. Yeah, actually, I didn't even say on Uber, it was it's a 
one of the side pluses is actually free to transfer within the app. If you've got Bitcoin, I've got Bitcoin. As long as we're both on that app, we can transfer it free, zero fees. Think about that for payment rails where there's large migrant populations, whether it's Indians sending money back to India or Filipinos sending money back to Philippines. It's zero fees, zero transactions. You can take it one step further and make sure that money, you're a Filipino helper in Dubai and you're sending money back every month to your husband to look after the kids. You want to see where it's being spent. Now you'll be able to track it as well. I always remember being at Consensus in 18 and there was a massive demonstration of people outside the conference there with billboards up in suits just like where I'm wearing today was the TradFi guys saying, give us back our jobs. James Diamond said it was a fake. It's fine to charge 17% for our Mexican workers to send their money home. Unfortunately, guess what? Those are the people that get screwed the most on the fees. That's what blockchain does, is it changes it, lowers those fees. We're lowering the fees. We want people to send money all around the world instantaneously and be able to spend it at a lot cheaper, cheaper transaction fees. Uh, guess what? Lobbyists try to slow this progression down. America wants it slowed down so the big boys can continue taking those fees. But it's only 5% of the world. It's still even true in Asia that over 60% of the revenue that the bank makes is essentially on remittance. It's, it's just horrible, like, right? You're taking a, money from the people that really need the money. The other problem is that people don't get bank accounts. If you just base it on the passport, of course, when you start in Europe, you do have, say, some discrimination because, let's say, these are in the rankings, higher quality passports and easier to KYC. KYC, See, yeah. but was the guy who was protesting against the British EU membership who was oh, kicked yeah. up Nigel and Farage. got his Coots account cancelled? So bad, right? <laughs> so bad, yeah. Politically exposed person because he had a view on the UK leaving Europe and was kicked out of a bank. As they say in England, it's not cricket. We essentially give people a bank account or a wallet for that matter we, that can be used in real life. Yeah, we do. We play by the rules, right? We can't take any countries like Iran or... Everybody likes visiting the US. We're doing things the proper way. We're not trying to disrupt the government's laws. We want to play by the laws to the book. So as long as that person can be KYC'd through our system, and our system is 60 seconds KYC. It's the best Israeli tech out, and we'll onboard them, and they'll be spending the crypto. We also do a background check on that crypto as well. But again, we don't want people spending on crypto that's been stolen. We want everything kebab board. So you're working with the user suspect chain analysis or something? Exactly, yeah. The best in there. <laughs> Everything's gold-plated. We're not quite in crypto winter anymore, no? Because Bitcoin is still like 30,000. Winter was under 15. But it hasn't really moved beyond that much. In crypto summer, one would say, you shouldn't spend it. That's the pizza story from 2011 or so. You should just hold on to your crypto and not spend it. So is winter better for this type of business because people are not that concerned about the valuation? Everybody's making money on altcoins, of course. People are going to spend it loosely. I think stablecoins volume was zero two years ago. Now it's $8 trillion, right? Obviously, people are going to spend more money in the stable coins. That's probably going to be our focus revenue driver, but we're happy to take the top 50. I think we need a good bull market. BlackRock uh, ETF approved and Bitcoin hits 100,000 and looks like it's going to a million. And all these old coins are going to rally. What are your objectives in terms of numbers or transaction volume? If you're launching in two weeks or so in Europe, what would be a good year if we're talking again the middle of 24? Because of the B2B element in our business, it's how many B2B partnerships we can do. On a B2C level, I think a million users spending each day would be amazing. And that's our focus, first a North Star. But longer term, I think this industry is expanding with like 50 billion users. We just want to be Apple Pay, that's it. From an Asian perspective, we have MoonPay in Hong Kong with Ivan. Do the comparison, Ubit versus MoonPay. Ivan's at the front end. Right, he onboards you via your credit card into the system. So actually, MoonPay is integrated into Uber. We take you out of the system, spending it. So very simple. Two different businesses. Ivan's the entry, we're the exit. You're based in Dubai, and there's lots of talk about that ecosystem as well. Do a cryptocurrency-related event, you need to get a permission to hold it. But clearly, quite a few people from Europe move to Dubai to continue yeah. their businesses. I know a few people coming from Japan as well. 
from our Japan perspective, I still understand what's going on in Hong Kong and Singapore. Dubai is yeah. like a bit further out. Maybe share a bit about what the ecosystem is like and how it has developed over the last few years. Yeah, certainly. We're a government's progressive in an industry. There's going to be players that turn up. And Sheikh Mohammed is an incredible person. He's built Dubai from the sand to what it is today in 40 years, under 40 years. One of his key industries pushes is blockchain. He's all in. That's the reason why we've got CZ, we've got Sandeep from Polygon, on. Lots of these big heavyweight industry players moved there. One of the big changes as well that happened three years ago was the accord between Israel and UAE. So they signed a peace treaty. I cannot tell you how much that changed. I thought Dubai before, I was nervous about it. It changed the game completely. Just if you're an Israeli or you're Jewish, from America, you're a little bit apprehensive about turning up in the Middle East. Now, there's one million Israelis have visited Dubai since the accord happened. Put that in context, Israel's six, seven million population. So they say the joke in Tel Aviv now is there's more Israelis in the Emirates than there are Emiratis. But so that's changed and the technology in Israel is incredible. We know that. That's brought a higher caliber of individual. You've got that. Then you've got all the other sort of refugee nations. Look, Russia's had its problems, obviously. Ukraine's got its obviously problems as well. Anywhere there's big problems, it brings a lot of refugees, and predominantly they're wealthy. That brings investment. People want to hire new staff. It's a big fan base for the UK, for Germany as well. I think we're the number one population, but we're getting eaten apart by the Indians. And my wife is Indian, that's a close number two. It's very easy step into Mumbai and uh, Delhi, and that's a one-hour flight. So you see a lot of uh, growth happening, and like that's the reason why Polygon sent the It's based there. They actually joke in India, it's the cleanest city in India, Dubai. If you go to Monaco, you're just old and rich. You can't build a business. If you come to Dubai, you can set up a company for 10,000 bucks, which is a three-year license, and you can hire 50 staff that don't need to be from the UAE. That means you can phone 1-800-INDIA and get 50 MBA or technologists to turn up in, in Dubai. You can't do that in the United States. You certainly can't do that in Europe. You've got to have high barriers for entry to get staff. This place is like booming because you can hire high quality staff, but you're not limited from where you have to hire them from. You, know? you don't have to hire them from America. You don't have to hire them from the UK. That's bringing a lot of business. The taxation being zero is a good place to start with any tax rate. We're not seeing the other thing as well that I didn't expect. I thought Dubai and the Middle East was going to be a benefactor of the population growth of India, the, the maturity of Africa. What I forgot about was they're sitting on a lot of oil. Oil went from 30 bucks to 100, okay, it's 75 now. But that means the coffers of these sovereign wealth funds and their sub funds, their smaller funds, their VCs are filled with cash. And that brings entrepreneurs who want investment. The VC system for crypto is still, I would say, small. There's 20 or 30 VCs there. But as it becomes more developed, it's expanding fast. It suits a non-American person better because U.S. get global taxation. For Japanese, I think it's perfect. I think for any Asian, it's great. And Europeans, we're fine. And there's still a smaller amount of Americans. There's a big Japanese community there. Great golf courses, they're there. And there's a, a decent Chinese population. And everybody gets on very well together. Whether it's Israelis to Iraqis, Iranians, whatever nobody cares it's an incredible place so i thoroughly recommend to anybody in your audience to come right out i'm very bullish on a 20-year trajectory you have to be exposed what about the cost of living singapore has been terrible post-pandemic for the last year yeah. or so all the horror stories about rents going up yeah. percent or more look Having a lot of sand, you can keep building. It's not like Hong Kong. You're limited on where you can build. So Hong Kong's just going to be expensive, period, with 1.8 billion Chinese next door to it. There is a lot of sand there. They can keep building. But property prices have gone up. There's plenty of places of dust where they can put more houses. So they'll control that. And they're aware that they want to build a country. How many countries do you know that want to double or treble its immigration to the size of the country over the next five, ten years? There's nobody. Everybody's, no, I don't want more immigration. I want to control it. These people are like, no, I want to treble the size of our country. From the Japanese perspective, where we have a declining population, mm. an aging population, a population that's going out of the countryside into the cities, they say they need immigration, but they don't really need it. And they don't really yeah. get it necessarily. And I think the, the reality is that clearly there's global competition. And if you are somewhere in India, and you're well qualified, educated, and you have a choice, where do you go? Something like the UAE yeah. is welcoming as you describe. And here I need to jump through so many hoops. 
it's a clear choice that I'm going to make, and it's just the nature of global competition and for talent. I think when countries are thinking about their tax rates, thinking about their immigration policies, they need to look outside of that country and see what the competition is. You know, and somebody wants to see your tax dollar or your consumer spend, but that's not necessarily your own country. Particularly with India, it's so close, and we're benefactors because we have a European passport, so you have a US passport, Japanese passport, you can go anywhere easily. A lot of countries can't, but they still have amazing talent. Education has zero barrier to entry now. You can be a PhD by learning on YouTube and be the smartest person around. Because of your passport, it doesn't mean you can get a job in America. In fact, they'll push you away. But Dubai is totally open. They'll take, oh, you're a PhD from Tehran University in computer science. Yeah, easy done. Try getting that passport person through the United States or UK. No way. It's very hard. Even if we go down the standard MBA, it's hard to get those people. India spits smart people. IIT is better than MIT. For entrepreneurs coming in, they're like, I'll take that human capital. Oh, is it a discount to what I would pay in San Francisco as well? And I pay no tax? It's compelling. If you take a side job as a commercial ambassador <laughs> for the UAE, for sure. Brings me to the question, what brought you to Dubai in the first place? Because you said you're also were yeah. investing in Japan from Hong Kong. So you spent a long time in East Asia. Now you're in West Asia, Middle East. 2003, we had SARS in Hong Kong. It had hell kicked out of it. Assets were cheap. And we had 1.8 billion Chinese next door to it. And it felt like the economy was moving up. The principal reason why I went to Dubai is it felt exactly the same. The accord had happened between Israel. COVID had happened. You've got India and Africa on the side of it. This place is on. Asset prices are cheap. I've mentioned all the other benefits, but it just felt like you don't want to invest at the top. You want to invest at the bottom. Ideally, I mean, we don't always get it right. But on a thematic, I think one thing I learned from being a banker, bankers are always good at spotting trends and thematics because that's how they make money quick. That's what I felt about Dubai. I was all in. Let's bet the ranch and burn the, burn the boats, as they say. Or macroeconomic. And macroeconomic, yeah. It's 20, 30 years to play out, so that's a good run rate to have. Yeah. I do feel like the same as here with Bitcoin. Do you really care whether it goes to 20K? Do you really care? Because the amount of blue chip names now that are lobbying for their ETF, this is not going to be 100,000. It's not going to even be 500,000. It's going to be a million. Well, that day will happen. Because I can't explain. I have three beautiful boys. I explain to them gold. And I explained to them Bitcoin, and they understand 21 million coins. They don't understand gold. It's a shiny piece of metal. It's got some utility. Bitcoin's going to beat gold. Forget a 10 trillion market cap. Once that ETF money comes in, the seal's broke. It's a charge forward. So I think we're sitting on the biggest gold mine, or Bitcoin mine of our lives here by being in this industry. It's still early. It's still way early. Yeah. I love the optimism. It's wonderful. All the best for you. Go live. It's great to see you here. We're watching it and we'll have a conversation around how to bring it to Japan as well. Oh, that would be amazing. Yeah, we'd love to do that. Thank you. Thank you.